The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. Today on Star Wars Ologies, we're chatting with Tracy Degerman about the ecology of everyone's favorite place to go when you're in exile, Dagobah. Star Wars Ologies is a podcast for Star Wars fans looking to connect real world science, technology, and fields of study to the galaxy far, far away. We'll be talking to psychologists about deprogramming the Mandalorian, engineers about building machines to work on alien worlds, and artisan cheesemakers about what you can do with blue milk. I'm Melissa Miller. And I'm James Floyd, and we're both freelance writers for Star Wars Insider Magazine. We are both big nerds for all things academic and all things Star Wars. All right, Melissa, punch it. You will go to the Dagobah system. Dagobah system. Welcome to Star Wars Ologies. This week, we are going to be discussing the ecology of the swamp planet Dagobah with our terrestrial ecologist expert, Tracy Daggerman. Uh, Tracy, tell us about your expertise in this field. Well, uh, I primarily work in restoration ecology, which is restoring damaged ecosystems. And what I see in Star Wars is a lot of, of ecosystems that have had impacts from visitation for many years. And that's the, my connection, my profession to Star Wars, really. So when you were deciding what to do for a living, did your love of Star Wars influence that at all? Actually, no. I, I was an eight-year-old when I uh, when I first saw Star Wars and uh, didn't, uh, didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life then. But being partially raised by a grandmother who thought public service was like the highest calling and then falling in love with a group of characters in Star Wars who pretty much dedicated themselves to serving a greater cause. That kind of led me into a field that where I could serve, um, you know, greater interest. And I also love nature too. So it was a perfect fit. Tracy, tell us more about the connection to, of Star Wars to restoration ecology. The way we see the galaxy far, far away, it's obviously been well-traveled, well, most of it anyway, for millennia. And so other than perhaps Dagobah and maybe the force, the force planet that we see in uh, Yo uh, Yoda's quest in the Lost Missions, we, I don't think we see anything that we could consider a pristine planet or a pristine ecosystem in Star Wars. And so it's kind of fascinating to me re-watching those films you know, after my, you know, completed my education in ecology to try and, and pick out what was native to those planets and ecosystems and what was not. And sometimes, sometimes it's fairly obvious and other times it's, it's like invasive species here on earth. Some of them you can, you can see obviously don't belong in their setting and others are so ubiquitous in the landscape. It's like, oh, they must have already been here, but you know, you know, they haven't. Can you give us an example of that in Star Wars? Uh, you see certain beasts of burden on uh, different planets. What does the guy ride on in uh, The Mandalorian? Blurg. Oh, the Blurg. Blurg, yes. Yes, you see that those on other planets and it's like, where, where are they from actually? Because yeah, it's, I think it's a case of trying to picture what, what habitat those are, are native to. Um, because you see them on in other settings, yeah, or or a big, very furry, long, woolly bantha on a desert planet. Right, right, yes, yeah, that sort of thing. I never even considered that. That is an potentially an inappropriate adaptation for that planet. Yes, yes. And then you said Dagobah is a good example of a pristine environment. You would think so. Um, I mean, Yoda chose it for some reason, although as we see in the Mandalorian from uh, Grogu's diet, seems to favor frogs and eggs and other things like that, that maybe Yoda chose it because it was very basically a delicatessen for all the things that he likes to eat. But it's one in which you can actually see the whole tree of life kind of play out and the, uh, the different layers of the ecosystem um, from, you know, things living in the water to the reptiles to the, the uh, pterodactyl-like things flying through the sky. And this is just so, so well illustrated in uh, Tyrrell's book, 
uh, Tara Whitlash's The yes. Field Guide of Star yes. Wars. Yes, yeah. amazing book. And just, I have I think they, whoever designed, I, I, I probably, it was, she had a lot to do with it, but whoever, you know, thought to include an ecosystem of that depth and scale in Star Wars is, I mean, it was brilliant. I didn't realize it at the time because when I first saw Empire Strikes Back, I was primarily focused on Luke. <laughs> but uh, no, seeing that as an adult was it, it, after, you know, getting my education. It's like there's so much to look at when you're watching scenes on that on that planet. Very so, well done. So you weren't looking at the the vine snakes and the bog wings and wondering what what real life creatures are those? Like what what is that lizard? And um no, you, you were looking at Luke or you. I was I, as a child, right. I was looking at Luke, yes. But it, it was later that I noticed there are a lot of other things uh, that are as interesting or perhaps more interesting. Uh, one thing that 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 strikes me though, given my experience, personal experience with pathogenic illnesses is, and this relates to to the other characters, you know, throughout Star Wars going to all these different planets is how they have an immunity to these different worlds diseases. And uh, I think a great idea for a future session of yours is to have like a virologist or an infectious disease specialist on. Um, Cause like, for example, when, when uh, Luke jumps off his, uh, his X-wing fighter into the Dagobah <laughs> swamp, I'm sure there were billions of other creatures in that water much, much, much smaller than the uh, creature that tried to eat R2, but Luke never gets sick. And so it's things like that, that as, as a scientist, as someone who has, you know, knowledge, vague knowledge of other, of uh, broad areas of science, but, you know, focused ecological knowledge, um, watching sci-fi movies, I sometimes have to just suspend that knowledge and just enjoy, you know, this, this is fiction. It's, you know, it's, uh, somebody's creation, somebody's idea, and uh, not, you know, think about, well, why didn't he get dysentery after he, <laughs> <laughs> after he went underwater in that that cesspool yeah, of a swamp? That, that maybe those rebel flight suits uh, keep leeches out and keep all sorts of uh, I don't know, really maybe gross there's, microbes. Maybe there's something in those food bars that they have in the little, that, little case that, <laughs> that, that cleans them out. <laughs> makes a lot of sense that uh oh my gosh yoda didn't didn't think much of it so his, i'm guessing his internal flora is probably uh probably very well adapted to everything that he was eating on that i don't planet. know now now that we get a still of it we're, we're looking at a still of it right now it, it doesn't look very appetizing at all no in fact in my juvenile mind i kind of thought it looked like a turd <laughs> Yeah. Well, and I called it a sausage when James and I were talking about it, just because mm -hmm. it's that sort of, you know, cylindrical shape. Um, yes. And he was like, oh, no, it's just some sort of like processed, you know, protein bar or something or, like that. No, right. which, it, is, it, it, which is, yeah. it also looks like a rolled taco. Right. Ooh. I think it's very dark. I'd never really thought about the fact that maybe Yoda moved to Dagobah because of the <laughs> reptile population. Um, I suppose it makes perfect sense that you want to move somewhere that can sustain you. Yes. Um, but next time I watch Empire Strikes Back, I feel like I'm just going to be seeing it through the eyes of Grogu with his insatiable appetite for frogs. <laughs> He's well, just like, food, food, yeah. food, <laughs> I'll eat that. Which makes you wonder, you know, what what is Yoda's stew that he offers Luke? And, you know, Luke makes that face and he's like, Yep. That has frogs and snakes. That has a whole new meaning for me now after seeing Grogu eat. It's like, oh yeah, I'm sure there was some nasty stuff in that stew. Yeah, I, mean, I think that you know the canon can be that there was a dark side force that there that shielded Yoda from from detection, but but yeah, no, he managed to pick a place that that suited his dietary his species dietary taste for sure. Whatever that species may be. <laughs> yes, yes. Hopefully, we'll find out someday. And where yeah. they're from. I don't know. I, I kind of like that being one of the untouchable mysteries of Star Wars is Yoda's species and, and where they're from. It's just, yeah. there, there should never be an answer to that question. Yeah, I, I get that point of it too. But when, when you're a biologist, you kind of want to know the origins of everything, <laughs> the name exactly. and origins of everything. That's yeah. exactly right. Can you tell us a little bit more about swamp planets in general? What would be needed to make that happen, you know, across the planet? 
most planets that we know of have different climate zones. I mean, they have poles, they, uh, they have different terrains, so there would be uh, climate zones related to terrain. Thinking of a planet that's just a solid one ecosystem, planetary system, is a little bit hard for for me well, to comprehend well, just what would you what would you need for just a swamp here on earth like like what factors go into making it a swamp versus making it something else you need a consistent water source for one thing you need a certain types of soils that hold water and you need plants and animals that uh, populate those zones and sort of keep it going without drying it out. That's why it's one of the reasons why wetland ecosystems, I mean, they can be resilient, but they can also be depleted if an invasive species gets in that changes the uh, some dynamic in there, either changes the uptake of water, like when invasive pond grasses or aquatic grasses that people have brought in as ornamentals get in, can just totally, you know, decimate a... Uh, a pond or swamp area. You need adequate precipitation, which means you need sort of fairly stable climate for that area. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of both uh, abiotic and biotic factors that, that go into creating a wetland or swamp ecosystem. They're very, they're very complex systems, very diverse. I delineate wetlands, uh, which is basically defining the edge of wetland vegetation from riparian vegetation. Riparian vegetation occupies that zone um, between aquatic vegetation and the upland vegetation. And it's an area that, that's like seasonally wet. Those species are adapted to either being inundated or ha having a period of dryness. But yeah, wetland, wetland ecology and wetland biology are themselves, in and of themselves, a, a pretty specialized field. And one that's actually a good area to get into because it's been the case throughout the 20th century and even into the 21st century that wetlands were not really appreciated for what they did for our society ecologically. And a lot of them have been drained and paved over, um, turned into farmland or subdivisions or what the, you know, the like. Now that, that we know what purpose they serve, they need people to know how to protect the ones we have left and to restore wetlands in areas where they used to be. So if, if you know, I know we're going to get to uh, encouraging people to go into areas of science later, but if we're talking about wetlands. That's, that's a pretty key area of concern these days. Yep, that's it. Dagobah. No, I'm not going to change my mind about this. I'm not picking up any cities or technology. Massive life form readings, though. There's something alive down there. Yes, I'm sure it's perfectly safe for droids. We see all of this rich plant life. Mm -hmm. um, do we ever, are we ever in Dagobah in the daylight or is it just because it always seems sort of darker there but is that just more a factor of it being this really thick canopy i think it's a factor of the canopy and i think it's also because it's it, the whole planet is wrapped in fog basically and you see that when you know luke comes in for his landing you know it seems from what happens to his ship. It's never been really clear to me if it's something in the atmosphere that causes his instruments to go haywire or um, if that's Yoda somehow um, working to bring him down to the exact right place where he is. But yeah, there's definitely a thick, uh, moist atmospheric layer around that planet, which is also something that could uh, factor into it being a fully a, a planet fully composed of of swamp and wetland. I'd, I'd like to go. imagine though that there are areas in there um, somewhere on Dagobah that's just like this Garden of Eden type place where the wetlands kind of recede a little bit and there's some like you know nice nice seasonally wet seasonally dry meadows full of wildflowers and it's one of my headcanon things to think about. <laughs> the one sunny spot on Dagobah. <laughs> yes. <Right. laughs> It's funny because I never thought about 
Yoda bringing him in to land in that spot. I definitely, as watching it as an adult, was like, wow, it's really lucky that he crash landed yeah, <laughs> 10 feet yeah. away from Yoda's house. But um, your idea makes a lot of sense. And it's just something I never considered before. Well, and, and people, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a big Star Wars fan. And in terms of my knowledge of actual how things, you know, like the actual deep canon of it, um, my knowledge is actually shallower than a lot of people's in that regard. And so maybe there isn't, there it has been explained how Luke ends up there. And I like to think that the uh, electrical interference is Yoda bringing him in. Because we kind of see a little bit of that later when he, uh, he uh, destroys the force tree uh, with lightning. So he could obviously control the climate a little bit. Right. I love that scene in The Last Jedi where Yoda makes fun of Luke for not reading the text before blowing up the tree. So there are these great creatures in Terrell's book that start as spiders and then eventually turn into trees. Can you talk a little bit about those? I think it's just as brilliant that here it is something that looks like a plant, a form of plant life, a tree, a swamp tree, uh, like kind of like our cypress trees down in the down in the southeast but it's actually a you know it's a spider it's 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 a moving organism and things like that and and the sarlacc which you think is an animal but it actually is a plant those little additions in the the star wars zoology are pretty fascinating to me I would actually like to see, you know, a short series or a Star Wars uh, nature documentary featuring some of these uh, these oddball, fantastic creatures that actually have parallels here on Earth. Insects like stick bugs that that look like plants, or butterflies with with big spots on their wings to mimic large eyes so they don't get preyed upon. Things like that. I, that uh, it's a really fascinating area for me. You know, talking about those spider tree things, they appear in Terrell's book and they were originally uh, based on concept art that uh, was done for Empire Strikes Back. And this concept art was you know, later reused to make the Krikna spiders of Adalon in, in Rebels. Maybe there's some connection there. Maybe, again, it's an invasive species one way or the other. Right. Uh, which would probably be problematic because, you know, who would carry those and drop them off on another planet unless they're like let's destroy this planet with giant spiders and how do they adapt the ice spiders also in the mandalorian are very clearly based off of this same concept art and you know in a swamp planet or something else it makes some sense but they really stuck out in the ice of the planet in the mandalorian i felt like yeah and it could be a case of where things were it's just it's just like we see with species that were originated on one continent and then similar type creatures end up on on different continents but they have different adaptations they've adapted um, through evolution to their environment and it's almost like wherever they wherever they originated from these these uh, spider trees or the, the space spiders in general somehow you know maybe they maybe they stowed away and and uh, like like so many invasive species do on ships somehow and get transported to different planets and then somehow you know the offspring of the offspring or end up adapting to a climate and, and becoming a separate species from the original uh, parent genus. I think that's an important lesson for our viewers that don't dump your space builds because that's how you get giant spiders. Yes, exactly. Yes. I mean, yeah, that's a good lesson for me. I'm very Indiana Jones about it. Like, why does it always have to be spiders? You know, yes. <laughs> they show up in, in Harry Potter. It shows up in Lord of the Rings. It showed up in the Mandalorian. And I don't, that is, I am scared of spiders. Um, oh, I, I love spiders. So yeah, whenever, whenever they appear and they're supposed to be scary, I'm more just like, Ooh. I'm jealous, <laughs> but they do. I mean, here on earth, they are adapted to all sorts of different environments, they right? Are. Aren't there cave spiders and, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any in ice. Yeah. I believe up at Mount Rainier. And I don't know if they're blown, they're blown up there, but on the, on the upper slopes of Mount Rainier, people have seen spiders, whether yeah. they actually live and reproduce up there. I, I'm not sure. I can see Melissa just crossing Mount Rainier off her list right now. <laughs> just like, nope, not doing it. Yeah. No, thank you. No, it's fine. When I'm in their environment, I'm, I'm respectful. So yes. Yes. Um, I was thinking about though, when you were talking about spiders, potentially 
catching rides on spaceships because that's something for the oceanographic research vessels that I go on. We have these systems to filter out and, and sort of secure the ballast water because we pick up ballast water in one ocean potentially, right. and then you dump it in a different ocean once you take on gasoline and stuff like that. It's mm-hmm. to just keep the ship from rocking and keep everything stabilized. And yeah. uh, I know that's a really big thing in the Great Lakes. I've heard about the zebra mussels. So it's just sort of interesting to think about that real world corollary mm-hmm. for what you were talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a big deal. I mean, here, whenever you cross the border into, into Washington state and in, in Oregon, there's there are signs to say boat inspection people have to pull off and have their boat inspected because yeah we're right now our our waters are free of zebra mussels hope it stays that way so are there any other topics in star wars that sort of tie into this that we should cover here today we we talked a little bit about this areas that 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 don't work for me and i kind of have to turn off my scientist side is the way the people travel to different planets and, you know, can always breathe the air. They don't need any special apparatus to, to survive. They, they don't get sick. Although I, get, I, I credit the Clone Wars with having the, the blue shadow virus. Uh, but that was something created in a lab. Um, so it's not some, like something they picked up um, in their travels. So, yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's something that's, that's always kind of a little bit of a pet peeve of mine it's like here on earth we, we travel and we we pick up all sorts of nasty things sometimes <laughs> they keep us in bed when we get back home so it's either people's immune systems and the galaxy far far away have 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 they've really gotten strong from all the traveling to different systems and being exposed to different organisms and atmospheres or that's that's how i try to see it maybe it's the will of the force that all planets have roughly the same atmosphere and gravity <laughs> and not a whole lot of really horrible pathogens. I don't know. Yeah, there's, there could be something to that. That, that I was going to yeah. hand wave it away of Mediachlorians the way that George Lucas <laughs> yes. sometimes does. So we're saying the same thing. <laughs> yes, maybe people's uh, Mediachlorians give them a special degree of, of immunity too. That's funny. Just from what we see in the movies about Dagobah, you know, what you know, speculate about what like the the web of life is like there, that that you know we there's a lot of darkness, but we see a lot of trees and we see a lot of you know reptile things. What is everything eating? Each other. There's a definite food chain, a food pyramid going on there. Yeah, I mean it's it's kind of like a, that scene in the Phantom Menace where they're going in that undersea part. Qui Gon says, "There's always a bigger fish." But no, I mean, it's, you get from the, the bottom of the food chain, which are, you know, the microbes, the funguses up through uh, plants and the things that eat the plant and the things that eat the things that eat the plants and go on up to the apex predators that eat pretty much anything below them. Um, and sometimes including each other. Um, and androids. Androids too, or try to anyway. So yeah, very, very complex food web on Dagobah. It would be someone's entire career to spend there mapping that out and identifying all the species, assuming they're not you know, homogenous around the entire globe. So Tracy, you tell us a little bit about your educational background, maybe places that you work in your career as a terrestrial ecologist. Yeah, I got a little bit of late start in science. Like I said, I uh, wanted to go do some form of, of like public service or something that, that in my career that had, that w- was for the greater good. And, uh, when I first started, this is why an associate's degree, if you're if you're not quite sure what you want to do, <laughs> is a really good thing because when I started out, I thought I wanted to be a photojournalist and you know, like go to the front lines and wars and protests and things like that and you know, document really important earth-shaking things. I watched a lot of documentaries um, when I was a kid growing up with my grandmother and also a lot of uh, nature shows too. But it was uh, my first science class. It's uh, an environmental science class where we learned about um, environmental issues. And that was really the first time that I'd ever been exposed to any of that information. And, you know, given my, my background of, you know, loving thing, loving nature and 
loving being in the outdoors, that's when it really clicked for me that I wanted to go into biology and specifically ecology. And from there, I uh, got an undergraduate degree in biological sciences with an emphasis in plant, plant biology and restoration ecology, because I really wanted to do um, restoration, ecological restoration work. From there, I uh, worked in both field studies for plant biology and ended up getting into a little bit of the aquatic studies before going to uh, federal employment. And I worked for the Forest Service doing surveys for sensitive, threatened, and endangered plant species and for the Park Service doing restoration work, basically areas that uh, repairing the visitor damage, like social trails and, and things like that. Uh, my last job for uh, nine years was I worked as the hazard tree co uh, coordinator for Mount Rainier National Park. A lot of specialized experience, you know, that, that would normally be done by a forest pathologist I picked up on the job. There was a lot of terrestrial e ecological aspects in that too, because there are a lot of things in a natural ecosystem that cause trees to become hazard trees. And it was my background in that generalized area uh, really helped me in that job. And now I'm, I'm looking to uh, continue in that area of more focused work where I'm serving as an advisory role to like other projects, whether they're uh, solar power installations or or other types of work projects where they need the input of a terrestrial ecologist to cover resource issues and you know environmental compliance issues. So that's the type of work I'm seeking right now. And yeah, do, do yeah, you have a, sure. a park ranger hat? You know, in my <laughs> it's so iconic, no, isn't in, it? No, I was never. Um, if people think that everybody that works for the park service is a ranger, but. Uh, uh, no, in in uh, in natural resources, we do not have to wear the flat hat, and I was always very glad of that because it, by all accounts, is basically a head tourniquet, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and they are not comfortable. They look really cool, uh, but yeah, they're they're kind of a beast to have on your head all, right. all day. Yeah, oh, that just crushes my dreams. I have ball I have ball caps though. I got yeah, I have plenty of ball caps with with park service the little park service patch on them so. i'm glad you asked that though james because there are things like that that people who aren't in the profession just assume it's the same with me when i was working in chemistry that it was like aren't you wearing a lab coat all day every day i'm like no i mean i certainly do what i need to but i don't just like walk around everywhere wearing a lab coat so uh right. same thing for for park service people mm -hmm. they don't all wear the hat mm -hmm. exactly yeah or the uniform okay yep. there you go is there anything oh. you want to pitch any you know publications or social media accounts or anything like that you'd like to mention i have a star wars fan account at star wars brat on twitter um and then for those of you who uh are really into politics which is one of my other other areas of interest which i will not get into here i'm also at tracy daggerman for now those two are, are ways to get to know me better Great. well thank Great. you tracy thank Thanks you for being on our podcast. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. I could I could spend a lot more time talking about this. And obviously James and I can too. That wraps up this episode of Star Wars Ologies. We want to thank Tracy Deggerman and we want to thank all of you for listening. We are part of the Skywalking Network where you can also find a variety of other great shows like Talking Apes, Classic Marvel Star Wars Comics, the Max FX Podcast, Neverland Clubhouse, Resilience Squadron, and the flagship show Skywalking Through Neverland. You can find all these great shows at skywalkingnetwork.com. And don't forget to check out our YouTube channel for screenshots from the movies that we mentioned and also pictures of Tracy in the field. Got an idea for a topic for Star Wars Ologies or know an expert in their field? Let us know at Star Wars Ologies on Twitter and Instagram or at starwarsologies at gmail.com. That's S-T-A-R-W-A-R-S-O-L-O-G. IES. No topic is off limits, even the taxation of trade routes and outlying systems. Join us next time on Star Wars Ologies when we'll talk to an extremophile expert about how space slugs, Minox, and Pergils exist in the cold vacuum of space.